conversation that a lot of people are very sympathetic to, which is questioning the gender roles that we've been, have been handed down. But it also seems that there is almost another perspective that's being smuggled in at the same time, which is an attack on the very concept of gender itself. People who are knowledgeable about the questions of sex and gender as they intersect evolution are, to my knowledge, without exception, interested in being compassionate and allowing people to decide how to live their lives as much as is practical. What we are not interested in is allowing a naive desire to make everything perfectly identical overwrite the actual rules of biology. Um, and there are places where this matters a great deal. The fact that a person uh, may identify as a woman does not necessarily negate the athletic capacity that they have inherited as a man. Should we allow people simply by identifying as women to participate in uh, women's sports, uh, including fighting? Should we allow you, after you've been convicted of a crime, to identify as a woman and go to a woman's prison? I mean, does that make sense from the point of view of protecting the women who are in a women's prison? So there are real questions. And one thing that concerns me a great deal is it seems to me that a great many people get some early unpleasant experience with science. They decide that they are not scientifically minded, which is a tragedy in and of itself. And they walk away from science, and then they start solving problems in their mind with how the world should be structured, and they do so in an ascientific way. And then they announce their solution, having realized, oh, the whole problem can be solved if we simply allow you to tell us whether you're a man or a woman. And the result is they have some uh, incredibly arbitrary set of cascading effects that stretch off into biology classes, they stretch off into the law, they stretch off into um, the rules of civilization, and these people have no, A, they have no sense that they have caused a serious problem, that the fact that the solution looked simple to them was only the result of the fact that they were looking at an artificially small piece of the puzzle. And by trying to solve that one small piece and letting the chips fall where they may with respect to the rest of the, the issue, they have made a much worse problem than we had. It is not difficult to make society compassionate to those whose gender is not one of the two most common genders. It is very difficult to write a solution that solves every problem all the way with no ambiguity. We are going to have to deal with the fact that if you are born in one sex and you decide at a gender level to transition to the other sex, there are certain things that are not going to be altered. And from then on, you are going to be in this third category. You are going to be somebody who has transitioned rather than somebody who has completely jumped the gap. And do you think that there are two forces at work here? Because usually with, with, with most trans people, they they are either a man who wants to transition to being a woman or a woman who wants to transition to being a man. But there is also this kind of, seems to me, there's this third force of an attack on the concept of gender itself. Do you think that this is part of the same phenomenon or do you think it's something different? Well, I have some experience with this. Evergreen had quite a number of trans students and some trans faculty. And so although I had never encountered a trans person prior to coming to Evergreen, by the time Heather and I left, it had been a fairly regular experience. And it became normal enough. In my experience, none of the trans people I was interacting with were aggressively interested in rewriting the laws of logic or telling biologists what to think. They did want to be treated with respect and decency, and they responded when you did. So my sense is that the attack on gender, which seems to focus on trans people, is not primarily being driven by trans people. It's being driven by other people who have an agenda, and trans is the excuse for bullying those of us who would say, actually, biology trumps these other considerations. 
you cannot overwrite the biology. You can make allowances for deciding to identify this way or that way, but the biology will remain what it is. So what is that force? If that is a, a different agenda, what is that agenda? Um, the agenda has to do with gaining the right to hard code solutions into the rules of civilization without inviting comment from experts in relevant so disciplines. power thing, pure and simple? I would say it is a power thing. I cannot say for sure if it is pure and simple. I don't know how this runs in the mind of people who are pushing this perspective, but I do believe that whether they understand or not that their objective is to accumulate power and wield it in their own self-interest, that that is in effect what is taking place. Take the trans issue as a, as a really good example. We've got trans people who want to be known by the other gender. They want to transition, men transition to women or women transition to men. But then there's this also, this sense of a different force, which is an attack on the whole concept of gender itself. Do you see the same thing, that there are these, there's almost two different perspectives and two different forces at work? I would say there are definitely those two and, and many more as well. Um, and, but that framing at least those two is, is apt, for sure. Uh, and um, among those who want to transition to the other gender, uh, there, are, um, there are many good, kind-hearted, smart people who are in this what must be completely miserable position of feeling that they were, and some people will use this language of being born in the wrong body, and some people don't use that language, but you know, need to transition in order to feel whole. And um, for those people, we, we owe them as a society our compassion and any help that we can give that doesn't run afoul of what else we know to be true. And uh, there are a whole lot of other people who seem to be claiming that, but actually seem to be gaming the system and looking to um, either just disrupt things or make some kind of personal profit. Uh, so there is, there is a problem with some number of the people who claim to be trans who actually look like they are not really playing in good faith at all. Um, as for the other, so all, you know, all these people who are we're claiming there are 84 genders uh, and using as evidence that I can't even remember what, you know, two or three cultures have names for a third gender. Um, this is more baffling, actually. Um, and it's, it's much more sort of standard authoritarian left stuff where they come up some, something has been generated that actually has no relationship with reality. And some very small fringe group is just claiming, you know what, it's not real, Gen you know, gender isn't a thing, which has then forced a number of sort of good people who didn't even want to be talking about this to say, well, you know what, gender is just a made up thing anyway. We're only talking about sex. And <clears throat> I would say, you know, sex is real and in animals it is very close to a binary. You know, what kind of gamete do you produce? Is it small and mobile and has almost no cell machinery whatsoever? Then you're male. And if it's large and has all the cytoplasm, including the mitochondria, and can't really move much, then you're female. There's new research out, I think actually just this week, providing evidence yet again that actually, yes, male brains and female brains have differences. Not that there isn't a ton of overlap. We're not talking about male brains over here, they all look like this only and ever, and female brains over here, they all look like this only and ever. These are, you know, these are distributions, widely overlapping distributions. But on average, you can tell, researchers who do this work can tell the difference. So what is gender? In non-human biology, we would call it sex role. So you have sex roles in sex switching reef fish where they do entirely female stuff until if you're the dominant female and the male in your group dies, 
maybe if you're of the right species, uh, you can switch and become a male. And you actually become a male. Like you start producing sperm instead of eggs and you've got testes and you've got all the male coloration. And furthermore, you start behaving like a male. So the behaving like a male part, that's the sex role. That's what we would call gender. So no gender isn't a human construct. It's not, it's not something that we created just for us. It's the behavior that goes along with all of the foundational anatomical, physiological, chromosomal, genetic you know, stuff that, that came before. Is it much more fluid? Is it much more variable? Is it especially in modern times with modern economies? Um, are some of the traditional expectations of gender roles outdated, unnecessary, and frankly, you know, somewhat alarming? Yes, for sure. We can throw a bunch of those out. But pretending that they aren't based on millions of years of evolution is batshit crazy. It's nuts. So, yeah, the, the people who are saying, oh, there's 84 genders, and gender isn't, there's no relationship between gender and sex, of course there is, and of course there aren't 84 genders, and are there as many ways to express gender as there are humans on the planet? Yes. That I would sign up for, but then that's not useful. Right? That's not useful as a category. Categories are about generalization. And categories always have, in biology, categories have fuzzy boundaries. They just do. That doesn't render the categories untrue or meaningless. Fuzzy boundaries being able to point to like intersex, and therefore claiming that male and female aren't real things. No, sorry, that's just fuzzy boundaries. Because I guess the fear on the left is that if you accept the reality of that binary, then you're accepting a lot of fixed gender roles. You're, right. you're accepting, that, that tends to be where the conversation breaks down. They, they hear that and they think, yeah, you want to keep me barefoot. You want to keep me barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. If you're, if you're going to claim that male and female are real, then I know what happens next. And I mean, frankly, we see this in the, this is a word with an unfortunate history in this context, but the hysterical reaction to Jordan Peterson, who is not a misogynist, and he's a little bit of a traditionalist, but not really that much, actually. And, um, and he's, you know, he's certainly not sexist. There's just no universe in which that, that is true. Uh, and yet what he is, is unflinching um, in, in claiming, in, in, in looking at the biology and saying, yep, male and female are real. And what's more, male and female traditional roles were built on those realities. I would say that we can do better than the archetypes and we can, you can look forward, abandon some of the old myths um, that we don't need anymore and that may actually be harmful and um, have even more, uh, even more flexible norms around what's, what's acceptable for, for male and female. But don't pretend that, I mean, I, I mean I've, I've said this before, but I'm sure in this context, if I were growing up right now the way I grew up, I would be, someone would be labeling me trans because I was a tomboy. I was an out and out tomboy who far preferred dirt to dresses and math to spending time in museums. And oh, well that's, that's gendered. Like, since when is math a male thing? That's not okay. Yes, more men end up choosing mathematically intensive careers and that, that is true, but you're now gonna say that if I as a woman, you know, from this you know, largely overlapping population of interests over in math space, um, because I'm interested in math, I'm therefore acting male, that's actually regressive and sexist and, and backwards. And this is why I say you know, the authoritarian leftists are actually the, the bigots you know, who are claiming to be anti-bigots. It's actually sexist and regressive and backwards to make a claim that by, you know, not wanting to dress in, a, in girly clothes, you're secretly a boy. No, you're not. No it way. seems very paradoxical that in, in this kind of trans ideology, what often comes in is this, this assumption that there is such a thing about a female role and a male role, and if, if someone is displaying those things, there is not the flex, it's almost bringing in fixed gender roles. Very much so. Yeah, it's, it's like it's creating archetypes. It's, it's, it's sort of culturally essentialist, if you will, uh, in which these e even somewhat fictitious ideas of what traditional sort of nuclear families from the 1950s looked like, you know, post-World War II, 
you know, Mad Men style um, family politics are the model for masculinity and femininity. And, you know, they're a model, but they're not a model I ever saw growing up. And, you know, most people, I think, didn't see those except in, in fiction. And imagining that those are the ones that we are all, like, that's the platonic ideal of masculine. Well, A, there is no platonic ideal of masculine. That's not how masculine works. And, and B, if you were gonna, if you were gonna force me to pick one, that's not the one I'd pick. You know, I'd, I'd think about men and women in terms of the average proclivities that they tend to have, and you know, the, and then the anatomical and physiological truths that you know, men are going to be on average taller and stronger and have deeper voices, and be more likely to take physical risks, and intellectual risks. And, you know, they're much more likely to live fast and die young than women. And to say, hold my beer, and then do something that looks really stupid, but, you know, the one time in a hundred that those sorts of things work, they end up the hero, right? And so it looks like stupid risk-taking behavior, but it actually works some of the time, and that's why it persists. And those are things that are more likely that men would do. I tend to do those sorts of things. That doesn't make me a man. But it puts me over in that, you know, more like the kinds of things that men would do. But that, you know, I'm not at all confused about gender, ide gender identity. There's the phenomena and there's this small number of people who are pushing this. But also there's the, the, real the realization that a lot of our institutions, in particular the media, seem to be wide open to, to this and seem to be making decisions based on this ideology. What do you, why do you think that is and what do you think we do about it? There's an aspect of game theory, which I believe explains the odd behavior of, let's say, our tech companies and our colleges. These are places where you would expect enlightenment values to reign and you would expect resistance. I mean, tech people are inherently next door to the sciences. How is it that they are signing up for these foolish notions? I think it has to do with the difference between the collective interest and the individual interest. Because stigma is the weapon that uh, is being wielded, an individual has to ask a question. An individual who might ideally want to steer their tech company to some sort of middle ground where it dealt compassionately but it uh, held fast to the Enlightenment values and scientific perspective, that person has to ask a question. Am I personally ready to suffer the costs of stepping out of line when this power grab is in motion? And most people will, they will buckle. They will say nothing and allow the power grab to take place. And then, even worse than that, not only does their cowardice cause them to be quiet, but they can't live with cowardice as an explanation. So they will then rationalize that the explanation that they have allowed to take hold is actually right. And so this is what I saw at Evergreen. I now see it in other colleges and universities, and I think we are seeing it in a, a great many places, including the tech sector. People are too afraid to speak up, and having been unable to speak up, they start lying to themselves in order uh, to make it feel better. And that is causing fiction to spread across the landscape, most frighteningly into places that are capable of booting you out of the public square if you say things that violate these uh, ridiculous uh, assertions. What do you make of the term patriarchy? Because it can easily turn into conspiracy theory, but also is there not some truth in that um, we have been running society along sort of effectively male values for quite a long time? Patriarchy is a myth. That is not the same thing as saying that there is nothing patriarchal. Patriarchal structures can exist, but a long-standing conspiracy of male against female does not make evolutionary sense. The vast majority of the genes in your genome spend half their time in male form and half their time in female form. So at the level of a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, they are ignorant of whether they will be the oppressors or the oppressed in some patriarchy that they set up. And in fact, they are condemned to be equal parts both. So patriarchy makes no sense as an evolutionary product. 
That does not mean that groups of men don't sometimes gang up on women. No doubt that happens, and it's a very serious problem. But the idea that this is society-wide and that we are uh, defending structures that put us at advantage is preposterous, logically. Now, it may be that the inherited division of labor that explains the difference between what males and females have traditionally done and the kinds of power they have traditionally had, that that division of labor has not aged well. That in modern times, that puts burdens on females that exceed the burdens it places on males. That's perfectly plausible. But that's different than alleging a conspiracy that has organized this uh, um, transfer of, of power from one sex to the other. You have a lecture where you talk about how the magic trick is done. Could you summarize what is the magic trick in that context? The magic trick is how power is usurped through certain kinds of arguments. So we are all watching something move across the landscape and alter what can be said, where it can be said, what kinds of language have to be used. And many people will tell you, nobody really believes that. And then others will tell you, oh, it's a tiny number of people, so it's, you're blowing the danger out of proportion. But those of us who are paying attention to it are watching institution after institution be lobotomized by these arguments that really don't rise to the level of a good discussion in a college dorm. These are not high quality arguments. They are not robust in the face of what is understood as a result of decades or in some cases centuries of study in different disciplines. So how is it that these wrong arguments carry so much power? That's the question. The answer in general is that Game theory provides loopholes where people can have power that is disproportionate to their numbers and disproportionate to the power of the logic underlying what they are saying. So um, the wielding of stigma in such a way that causes people to be much more likely to voice one perspective than the counter perspective, understanding the, uh, the biases that exist as a result of a sometimes cynical use of game theory uh, is what that, that lecture is about. You've described yourself as deeply progressive on the Rubin Report. And one of the, one of the questions would be, given that the authoritarian right seems to be on the ascendancy politically in a lot of places in the world, why focus so much on what a lot of people say is a small corner of the left or the excesses of the left? Well, I, I think this is actually something of a bum rap. I'm a biologist. I'm interested in phenomena to the extent that the phenomena I'm interested in have caused me to run afoul of different populations, I'm responding to them. To the extent that there is a fringe on the far right that has a racist view and wishes to turn that racist view into policy, I challenge them. And this is something I've done repeatedly. To the extent that there's something on the left that wants to pretend that gender is an invention of men who wish to oppress women, I've challenged them. So what I would say is I didn't choose my antagonists. They chose me. And in choosing me, they simply started saying things that run afoul of what I know to be true. And my job is to elucidate why those arguments are incorrect and help people see the arguments that are correct. I can't really be faulted for doing that in an even-handed way, and if the burden of it falls more on one side than the other, that's a result of the fact that that side is spending more time uh, leveling absurd charges. How does the left get its house in order? How does it identify the people who are actually antithetical to its interests and draw boundaries around what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? I see myself playing two roles since uh, May of 2017. One is I am allowing something on the center right to understand that the left is not completely insane, that it actually has a noble, decent history that has been right about a tremendous number of important topics and that we are all collectively benefiting from what it has been right about. And the fact that it is presently having a spasm of insanity does not tell the whole story. The right needs to remember that, and I very frequently 
run into naive arguments on the right where people are saying, can we just finally do away with the left? Everybody can see they're crazy. That's the only thing over there. And so it's very important that somebody says, no, that's not the sum total of, of the left, and it never has been. The other thing I'm doing is I'm demonstrating to people on the left that it is possible to say something that is not in the current fashion and live to tell the tale. And simply by demonstrating that it is possible to make sense as a progressive and not fall victim to this uh, cabal is, I think, also very important. It's keeping people from fleeing to the right. Now, one of the things I also said on Rubin is that I was never on the left for social reasons. I wasn't on the left because their cocktail parties were more pleasant to me. I was on the left because logically that's where I landed. So the fact that I have taken an awful lot of flack from the left doesn't alter my position on what's true because why would it? What's true is true, irrespective of whether there's anybody to talk about it with.